I am delighted to be with you uh, for this important conference on connecting with your spouse, the first of the family following Christ's summer marriage series. There is hardly a more important work that couples can do for their families than to grow in unity by communicating well and by being faithful to each other. That's the stuff of marriage. It is good for you to uh, sometimes to take, to withdraw from your daily affairs, even from your children, and in order to invest uh, yourselves in your marriage. I am grateful to Jeff and Allison Mall for the invitation to be here with you and to talk a little about the Catholic concept of marriage as a vocation. I also thank Brandon and Katie Duncan, uh, who work with me, for their tremendous work in coordinating all the activities of this three-month uh, series. And to start, let me make an observation about the covenant relationship that we have with our God. We are immersed in a great mystery, one which God spoke from the first page of the Bible, it is the mystery of God's merciful love for us all. God loves us first, as St. John says. From the moment of creation to the final consummation of the world, this mystery is played out in human history, and every one of us is a part of it. We are involved in this process, in this mystery. Not surprisingly, the primary image that God chose to express his love for his children is through the history of marriage. Historically, God's love for his people was reflected in the many covenants which he formed with the people of Israel, the first portion of God's people. But in the era of the church, his love for each of us is reflected through the sacraments. If you think about it, we often use marriage imagery to describe the sacramental life of the church and that place of final destiny to which we are all called. Take, for instance, baptism. We use baptism clothes with a wedding garment of salvation and anticipates the white robe participants of the wedding feast of the Lamb in heaven. Confirmation, a sacrament that I am very expert on, <laughs> confirms our baptismal covenant and strengthens us, our relationships, with the mission of salvation through Christ's bride, the church. Penance restores the covenant when we have broken our marriage bond through sin. Eucharist is a foretaste of the final wedding banquet of heaven. Even the sacrament of holy orders calls men in a metaphorical way to serve the bride of Christ, the church, in imitation of Jesus, the bridegroom. And Father Francis and I could tell you that our celibacy would not have any meaning if it is not connected to that love of the bride and the bridegroom. It is, most people think that celibacy, our vow of celibacy, is related to service, and indeed it is, is to be more available, but primarily is, is a relation of the heart, the bride and the bridegroom. The sacraments express the rich marriage imagery very easily because Christian marriage is perhaps, perhaps the most direct reflection of the covenant of the love of God in this world. And even if you go to the mystical literature of the church, San Juan de la Cruz, uh, the, the St. Bridget, and we could mention many, the highest level of union with God the language of that highest union is a marriage language, even, I would say, erotic language in the sense of Benedict XVI 
in God is love. Encyclical. Our magnificent catechism speaks of marriage as an intimate community of life and love, of love and life. And, and, and it makes sense that it is love and life because love comes first. And life is the fruit of, of love, of the love of the mother and the father. The married, and I quote the catechism in, one, uh, in 1603, the married state, the state of life, of marriage, has been established by the creator and endowed by him with his own proper laws. God himself is the author of marriage. The vocation to marriage is written in the very nature of man and woman as they came from the hands of the Creator. Beautiful language. The order of creation. And that's why even even if if you even even without talking about the sacrament of matrimony, a, a, a marriage and a family has such dignity regardless of the connection with the sacraments, because it's the order of creation. And when we have a wedding, and we, one of the prefaces for the wedding ritual talks about those two orders, the order of creation and the order of redemption, which that magnificent beauty. In other words, the vocation to marriage is part of a grand design that God intended for humankind from the beginning. And John Paul II was fascinated, St. John Paul II, with the beginning because he would see that design of God. And it is a plan for the sanctification of men and women as well as for the building up of the human race, the human community in the kingdom of God. And I am convinced that if this is God designed, Satan, the enemy of the human race, as St. Ignatius calls him so properly, tries to undermine that order of creation. Satan, the evil one, tries to undermine that order. And we see it in front of our own eyes today. The Eucharistic dimension of marriage. While Christian marriage reflects the grand design of the whole Christian life, marriage itself finds its source and its strength in the Eucharist because it accomplishes the same goals as this most blessed sacrament, which we celebrated last Sunday, Corpus Christi. In the Eucharist, we are drawn into the very sacrificial love of Christ for us. And it is through the reception of Holy Communion that we learn to love others as he loved us. In his famous prayer after communion, Thomas Aquinas prays that the Eucharist may teach us charity and patience, humility and obedience, and growth in the power to do good. The Eucharist does all that and gives us the strength to continuously grow in Christian virtue. The Eucharist is also the source of the unity of the church, as St. Augustine said it so well. The sacrament of faith, the bond of unity, and the link of charity. In fact, without the Eucharist, we would not even have a church. St. John Paul explained it so well in his encyclical, his last encyclical, the Church of the Eucharist. And of course, it is our Eucharistic faith that causes us to go forth and transform the world, or at least a little portion of the world, the one that we deal with, into the kingdom of God. Last, uh, the other day I was talking to Terry Morgan, Father Terry Morgan of the Cathedral, you know that he has a column in our magazine 
And I always like to see the face of Father Terry Morgan in that column of our magazine. It's a very uh, sympathetic face. And he was, he was saying, yes, I am going to Mass, and we are going to have at the, at the end of the Mass, I am going to invite the congregation to come to the door, the back of the cathedral, and we are going to sing a hymn. And later on, he sent me the copy of the hymn that they were going to, to sing for that Mass. And it was a way like facing the door, uh, the exit of that assembly to bring the love of Christ to society. And I found that fascinating and creative, uh, like, like to, to come visibly to the door, the door that is so important for the year of, of the Jubilee year of mercy. And, and we come to the door to pass on that door, that transition, and bring the love of Christ uh, to, to society, to families, to work, to leisure, all that work that is a network of the civil society. It is in these several ways that there is a deep connection between marriage and the Eucharist. In fact, as Christian spouses, you live out the Eucharistic dimension of your marriage vocation every day through three related missions. The first mission of Christian marriage is to learn and to teach love. As simple as that. It's a school of love. Marriage, like the Eucharist, it teaches us to love. The second mission of marriage is unity. Is in that diversity of person becoming one heart, one mind using the language of St. Paul. And the third mission is to evangelize. Allow me to explain these three missions of marriage and the family. Christian marriage is a school of love, and I highly recommend to you in Amoris Laetitia, the uh, post-synodal exhortation of Pope Francis, uh, this uh, on love in the family. Uh, it is truly extraordinary, chapter four and five. Uh, I read it last Tuesday. I, I, I apologize that I have been so late in reading this important letter. But um, I was really taken by these two chapters, four and five. And uh, love in marriage uh, is chapter 4, and it is a commentary on Corinthians 13. Um, and that commentary in a context of marriage and family is truly extraordinary. I, I recommended it as a personal reading, as a reading with your family, as a reading, you know, summer is a time of reading. Y you, you will not be disappointed. And, and you know, usually... Uh, documents in the church have a reputation that it is for scholars and for philosophers and for um, priests and bishops. This one is for you. Is it, you don't get a feeling that it's a pope, the supreme pontific of the church who is speaking. It's, it's like Papa in the midst of the living room uh, in, a, in a very cordial and pleasant conversation is absolutely easy. And in, in a tweet that I, I did just after reading it uh, last Tuesday, I said, if, if re here is a chapter of family happiness. If we really implement this vision, there is no, there is, there is successful marriages and wonderful families. Marriage, a school of love, is this, the, the, the family of Nazareth. Uh, I have an icon done by the Chenaculo community, a Christmas gift of the Chenaculo community, of a holy family, made by this young man and women. And 
the, that icon says everything about that family, the family per excellence, the family of Nazareth, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. No wonder in this diocese, two parishes are holy family. Um, it is difficult school, the school of love, and it can be a demanding teacher because love is the most important virtue and the value of the kingdom. As you know, Corinthians 13. Marriage teaches couples over time how necessary it is to put God in the absolute center of our lives. If you are not clear about that early in your marriage, you soon learn it. The trials of life, the economic ups and downs, the challenges of raising children, as well as many other sufferings that are part and parcel of life, make it abundantly clear that we need a greater strength than our own meager resources to help us survive. The couple that keeps the Eucharistic Lord at the center of their marriage and family life and adores him every Sunday will never be lacking in grace and favor, especially when they need it the most. I know a priest who once told me that he was sure that his parents never once miss a Sunday Mass in their 60 plus years of marriage. He was equally convinced that even before they married, they have never missed a Sunday Mass because their parents, the priests, grandparents, were equally devoured. There is something truly marvelous and inspiring about that long-term fidelity. I do not need to tell you how marriage also helps spouse to become more loving people and good teachers of love to their children. There are at least a million ways and opportunities to practice the virtues of love with your spouse on a daily basis. Even Pope Francis talks about three words, I am sorry, please, <laughs> thank you. He even has a whole chapter on those three words that are in a way almost magical for, for keeping a family together. This virtue, St. Paul, as you know, put it in Corinthians 13, of which Pope Francis makes that commentary. And love is patient. And, you know, it's the first thing that Paul says about love, patience. And, and I think he's right. That's the first feature. Why? Because we are so vulnerable. Why? Because we are so imperfect. Why? Because we are sinners. And we need the other to be patient with us. And we need to be patient with the other. All the time. All the time. And love is kind. It is not jealous. It is not pompous. You know that. Probably you chose that reading for your wedding. We all have to learn those virtues somewhere. The priest learns them largely through the, past, the practice of the pastoral ministry or living in community with other religious, as, as uh, Father Francis. Spouses learn them in marriage and family life. This is precisely because marriage is a school of love designed by the Creator to give us the forum to which to practice virtue and practice makes perfect. It goes without saying that parents hand on the virtue of love to their children, and at the same time, and in the same environment in which they themselves are learning to become more loving people. It is, a, it is an ongoing school of love. The learners transform into teachers in both a natural and a supernatural way. Perhaps you are teaching your children to love and you are learning to love in the process as well. I have noticed that most parents have a natural teaching ability to guide and train their children in the lessons of life because God equips his people with natural capacities to do the jobs he gives them. 
it is not my intention to spend time dealing the many ways in which you make your family life a school of love for your family, but simply to note the fact that your vocation to Christian marriage makes you both learners and teachers at the same time. By definition, and that is a great and wonderful reality, perhaps more beautiful than you are aware of. Christian marriage and unity. When we speak of vocation in a strictly religious sense, we're speaking of those who are called to dedicate themselves to the service of the kingdom of God. Usually, even though Father David Ruchinsky continuously say, everyone has a vocation. Priests, deacons, and bishops in particularly, particular receive the sacrament of holy orders as a way of consecrating them for that mission. Religious sisters and brothers consecrate themselves through their vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. Our Catholic Catechism calls holy orders a sacrament in the service of unity. Because priests do so much to maintain the unity of the church through the celebration of the Eucharist, among other things. But you may be surprised to know that the Catechism also calls marriage a sacrament in the service of unity. Marriage, like the priesthood and consecrated life, serves the unity of both the church and society in a very real way. Have you ever noticed how children who come from broken families tend to gravitate to families that are intact? They crave the stability that such a family offers. Kids of every age will evaluate marriage and family according to their own needs and stages of development. Your younger children will consciously choose, unconsciously choose, friends that come from happy families and spend more time over their friends' homes than in their own. Teenagers will bask in the warmth of a stable and happy marriage because they are thinking about their own futures and looking for role models to emulate. Even if those kids don't ever speak of their need for unity as such, the intact marriage and family exerts a dramatic pull like iron violence to a magnet on those who experience brokenness in their family of origin. In this humble sense, the church recognizes that Christian marriage is a radical force of unity in the world. It was so wise of the catechism to designate marriage as a sacrament in the service of unity. And how desperately we need unity in a society that is so polarized today. Even our political community shows it so clearly. Truly, as Christian spouses, accomplish more than you know by simply living faithfully your vocation to marriage. There is a grace that far transcends the two of you as a couple. There is an energy that surpasses you. God, as it were, enables you to build up others, to build up the church, and even to build up society by your unity. To return to our Eucharistic analogy, if the church remains strong because of the Eucharist, society remains strong precisely due to the strength of good and healthy and happy marriages. Marriage and evangelization. As you know, there is such a deep connection of Pope Francis' joy of the gospel, his passion for the evangelization of the world, and Leticia, Am Amoris Leticia, the joy of the love of the family, the, lo the joy of loving, the love of loving. That leads me into the third Eucharistic mission of the married vocation, which is to evangelize. I would say that this dimension of marriage goes beyond just the daily living out of your calling 
and enters into a mature and deliberate vision. When couples realize how powerful a force of their Christian marriages can be, they become transformed into missionaries. In the priesthood, as with marriage, it is easy to go through the motions and fulfill our basic duties and responsibilities well. These things in themselves are valuable, but they are not enough. I would like each of you to take some time tonight or, or the next couple of days reflecting on the way in which God has called you as a couple to evangelize others in your own special way. Most of you, I am sure, will look into your lives and recognize that you are already accomplishing some form of a special, a special Christian service without calling it evangelization as such. In all likelihood, the service that you are already performing is humble and not spectacular in a worldly sense. As St. Therese of Lisieux would say, uh, to do ordinary things with extraordinary love. The little way that Therese of Lisieux taught the Catholic Church. That is the way of simplicity and the way of loving out of our vulnerability, out of our littleness. Some of you may not yet be aware of just how God is enabling your marriage for evangelization. Perhaps you are doing it, perhaps you are witnessing, and you have not realized it. This may be rather a time of discernment and petition to ask him how he wishes to enable your gift of marriage for others. And you may well imagine that if he gives you a particular mission to accomplish, he will also give you the grace to accomplish it, both for the service of others and for the sanctification of your souls. Be not afraid to offer your marriages to him who call you to this state of life for the sake of his kingdom. As the priest sends us out at the end of the Mass to love and serve the Lord, so the Lord Jesus sends your marriage out as true missionaries of his kingdom. I am sure that you are familiar with the story of San Gianna Beretta Mola, who sacrificed her life in 1962 when confronted with a serious problem pregnancy rather than choose abortion for her child. St. Gianna Mola, blood sister, is a religious nun. Her name is Virginia, Sister Virginia Mola, who travels the entire world witnessing to St. Gianna's heroic act. Yet, when listening to the testimony of Sister Virginia, one is initially surprised to hear very little about her saintly sister. She always begins her talk speaking about her parents and the marvelous family that she grew in. Her parents' example conformed to every standard of heroic sanctity and goodness that we can imagine. Sister Virginia tells the story about the mutual love of her parents, the unity and discipline of their large family, their devotion to their Catholic faith, the children's respect and love for one another, and the deep happiness of their home during very hard economic and political circumstances. It was all due, she said, to the sacrificial holiness of her parents, which was so great that they produced 13 children during the turbulent years surrounding the First World War. St. Gianna was the 11th child, and her sister noted that after Gianna made her first Holy Communion at the age of five, thank goodness to Pius X, she went to Mass every day with her mother. When Gianna was 15 years old, she made a, a retreat with the Dorotean sisters, and one of the numerous resolutions she wrote in her journal from the, that retreat was, 
I would rather die than commit a mortal sin. Now I ask you, how does a 15-year-old girl acquire such an attitude? How could she acquire that level of faith and sanctity? Surely, God's grace that she received each day in the Eucharist was paramount. But let's remind ourselves that grace builds upon nature and that there had to be a good garden into what this seed of profound faith would be planted. That garden was the family in which the Mola children had grown up. That family was formed by profoundly Christian parents whose marriage was immersed in grace. When Sister Virginia finally speaks about the heroic act of self-sacrifice for which St. Jana is known to the world, she says that the act of giving her life for her baby was not only act of generosity of the saint's life, it was just the last act of many acts. She loved them to the, to the end. In a unique modern witness to sanctity of human life, the saint, who was a medical doctor herself, absolutely rejected abortion as an option for the child. And she challenged the attending medical personnel to save both lives. Ten days before the child's birth, she said to her family, if you get to the point where you have to choose between the baby and me, choose the baby. Her greatest sorrow was not for herself, but that she would have to leave behind four little ones without their mother. True, her death was an immense loss for all, but what an example she left to those same children who knew that their mother made the ultimate sacrifice for one of their siblings. That sacrifice was the act of a woman who had grown up in a family where every single child was seen as a blessing from God and accepted without reserve by parents whose vocation opened channels of grace for them to transform the world. Now, the world has been amazed and enlightened by the example of St. Gianna Beretta Mola at a time when such a heroic witness is needed. If St. Gianna was capable of such a gift of self-sacrifice, it is only because she received and learned such generosity from her parents. If St. Jana is the patron saint of mothers of unborn children, it is because she was first a disciple of the school of her parents' marriage. Dear married couple, what a blessed calling you have. I love the catechism paragraph where it puts the sacrament of order and the sacrament of marriage together. Very few people, your children included, will see or appreciate the sacrifices that you make on a daily basis of your families. I know that by experience. I only appreciated my parents' education and my parents' sacrifices, those that I even do, do not even know later in life. And probably it happens to us all. It is only later that we begin realizing how good our parents have been with us. But God sees, and God sees your many sacrifices, and that is all that matters. Have no fear at all in allowing the Lord to enable your marriages to transform the world. Thank you. <laughs>